Okay, we'll go ahead and, and get started here. Let me, uh, I'll scroll back through our little chat right here. People quite often watch the recordings later and they can't see us talking about uh, the weather <laughs> and the like. So anyway, no Siri, I didn't ask you for anything. Gosh, what did I say? <clears throat> yeah, it always is weather and politics, right? And in the deep South football and that kind of fun stuff. But it is good to see y'all ladies on this uh, cold or hot day, whatever it is, wherever you are. And so uh, let's pray together. We're going to jump in. You covered a lot of stuff this week. <clears throat> this is Romans part one. Uh, lesson number, lesson 12, I think, right? Uh, lesson 12. And so as y'all pray, uh, do pray for us. There's just a bunch of folks uh, in uh, our around our lives that are just really, really sick. I've got a one praise team member that uh, literally had brain surgery two weeks ago. She sang with us yesterday. She's doing great, but she does have brain cancer. Had a, another one that sang with us for years and years. And he, he retired a few months ago and he's in ICU right now. And I'm real concerned about him. I'm not, I'm not sure he's going to be with us much longer. <clears throat> and then just several, several others that are in those kind of situations. Uh, it's just one of those seasons, you know? So, uh, uh, let's see. I was about to ask Kim, you know, my mother-in-law has been sick a month, second round of antibiotics and steroids. Okay. Yeah. we got a bunch of folks with that kind of stuff too. Anything else y'all would like to bring before us to pray for? Okay. So Sean, Sam, yeah, I'll throw, I'll throw one of mine in there. Same thing related to that. <clears throat> Same kind of things. You know, I still chuckle at young couples when they have two or three year olds and they're giving them fits. And I said, oh, I'll be glad when they're older and they're not so much bother and worry. <laughs> I just look at them and go, yeah, you don't know what you're talking about. It doesn't. Yeah. With three-year-olds, you can always make it okay. When they're 33, it's a different thing. You know? <laughs> so, but they're blessings nonetheless, right? So, Father, I do thank you uh, for gathering us together this evening, this morning, this afternoon, wherever it may be. And, Father, I do thank you for the children that you have blessed us with. And, uh, Lord, for each one, particularly these situations, I pray, Lord, that above all things, that they will seek you first. And that Kelsey and Sam and Sean and all of our other children and grandchildren uh, will do nothing more or less than that. And, uh, Lord, you know how we do uh, keep them on, on before you on our hearts. And so, uh, Lord, I pray that uh, they will seek you first, seek you in everything. And that, Lord that they will uh, realize uh, just how much you really love them. Father, I do lift up to you uh, the many uh, that we know that are undergoing physical type of things, uh, stresses and trials and uh, diseases, sicknesses, uh, Lord, so many things. <coughs> so we bring them before you. Uh, those that need a physical touch, Lord, we speak your healing upon them. Uh, Lord, just touch them, strengthen them. And then, Father, for so many that are, uh, uh, how do I want to put this, that are doing religious things, and yet, Lord, they don't really know you. There's just so many like that. And so, Father, uh, I pray that uh, that there will be things in their lives that they will seek you first above all things, and that it will not be the type of thing that... Uh, just a religious activity anymore but lord i walk with you a relationship with you unlike anything that uh, they've ever experienced before lord i pray that for all of us that uh that there will be a depth unlike anything we've experienced i thank you lord for the time that uh, we've had in your word this week and for the uh, way that you continually show us truth uh line upon line precept upon precept and I pray that you will do so this evening also. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.
<clears throat> Excuse me. So y'all will have to forgive me. If I'm sitting here in the middle of this still dusty office. I'm not sure what I'm going to do about this thing. <clears throat> but anyway, what did y'all do this week in your study time in the Word? Okay, you did a bunch of cross-references related to what? Yeah, Abram, Abraham. Well, why are we looking at Abraham? We're studying Romans. People will ask that kind of question, by the way. Okay, Abraham's belief. Yeah, we saw in the last week or so that faith was credited to him as righteousness. We saw that in the fourth chapter of Romans. So we've seen up this point in time that the whole theme, shall we say, of Romans is that the righteous shall live by faith. And the Spirit is leading Paul to write to give some insight into that, uh, dealing particularly with the Jewish people, but also dealing with Gentiles who are of faith. And so I said, Paul is using Abraham to explain uh, all sorts of elements about faith. And what we've seen at this point in time is that when Paul's writing in the first chapter, he talked about the gospel in the first part of that chapter and how God's righteousness is, uh, is the, the gospel is the, the power to save, to put us in right standing with him. And he talked about righteous men and unrighteous men, the last part of the first chapter about the unrighteous. And the bottom line is that God's going to pour forth his wrath upon the unrighteous, upon those that don't believe. And so in the second chapter, uh, Paul was starting to deal, particularly with the Jews, to where they don't get a big head about that. You know, they they were saying that they were righteous because they were uh, God's people, and that's not exactly right. Okay, I mean, you can sit there and be of the right line, but if you're not a doer of the law, okay, then you're going to be just like the Gentiles. And he was talking about that in the second chapter. Only the doers of the law are just before him. Well, what does that mean? Well, he continues on in the third chapter, and that's where we find out. You know that whether you're Jew or Gentile, that no man is righteous. Everybody's what? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So uh, God's going to judge and there's no partiality. So he gets to the fourth chapter and he's using Abraham, how to explain faith. So what did he say <clears throat> just real quick in, in the fourth chapter about Abraham? We'll come back at the end of the lesson if we have time to deal with some details. But how did he go about using Abraham to explain that, that arena of faith? What did Abraham do uh, to be righteous? There you go. He believed. Yeah. I'm always amazed at how these courses sort of weave together, going from Hebrews to Romans, <laughs> you know, and that kind of thing. Yeah, he believed. He believed God. And God counted it, reckoned to him as righteousness. So Abraham is the example that's being used to explain this righteousness by faith. And he's also the example that's being used of how to live it out. <coughs> okay. Of how to walk through all this kind of stuff. So at the very beginning, uh, I think it was the first verse, wasn't it? At the fourth chapter, Abraham was described as being the forefather of us all. Uh, the forefather of us, particularly the Jews at the beginning, by the time you get to the end of the chapter, you find out, that he's the forefather of not only the Jews, but the Gentiles, but he's the forefather of all those who believe. Let me see what y'all saying. Jan says he believed God could bring back. Okay, Isaac, yeah, we'll look at that in a minute. Yeah, he believed that uh, literally in resurrection from the dead, right? And Rachel says, yeah, real Jews. <clears throat> well, boy, that's not politically correct nowadays, is it? So anyway, we went back and we did some cross-references. <coughs> And so when you go back to do cross-references, where do you go to? Yeah, of course. And you always go to Genesis. So tell me, what did you learn from Genesis chapter 12 uh, about Abram at this time? Yeah, I'm about two hours from Nashville, two and a half hours. Come on, you planning the trip in? <clears throat> we actually go to Nashville a good bit. We used to never do that. And uh, <laughs> the reason we do now, y'all know the honest thing, is because uh, I have a car that'll make it from there and back normally now. <laughs> oh, Nashville's great. Uh, tell you, Rachel, where uh, Lynn and I are right now, and where Lynn used to live here, uh, it's really a blessed place because we're 
two hours away, two and a half hours from Nashville, about three hours away from Chattanooga where Precept is, about three hours away from Atlanta, about three hours away from three and a half hours in Memphis, hour away from Birmingham, hour away from Nashville. And there's a lot of people that do what Lynn's done. They'll come and park their motor home in North Alabama right here and then just do day trips the whole winter long. I mean, it's just, uh, uh, yeah, a lot of history here. Uh, Nashville is a great place to go and hang out for a month or two. <laughs> it really is. So anyway, <clears throat> oh yeah, well there's there's writers there of uh, uh, literature type of music. Um, you know, Nashville, New York, and uh, Los Angeles are the centers of music, and Nashville more so than the other two nowadays. Of every style, not just country. I mean, every style. Uh, it's, it's ridiculous. But it is a, a really interesting laid back place. So Jan being ever so faithful has drawn us back to what we're supposed to be doing. Thank you, Jan. <laughs> oh no, not sorry. You talk, what are you talking about? You know, I love, I love these classes. Uh, we do the same thing locally, you know, because you know, this is life, you know, and uh, you know, if we can't sit there and, and chat about some things, what good are we, you know? Yeah, so in uh, chapter 12 was my question, Jan. Yeah, chapter 12 of uh, Genesis. God told Abram uh, to leave Ur, okay? And first gave him the promise to be a great nation, okay? I'm a little concerned about us opening up Rachel's eyes. I think she might have been better sometimes hidden in the on the outer periphery of things. So what was that promise that God made to Abram, okay? He told him to leave his country, right? Leave your relatives and your kindred. Remember that? Did Abram obey that instruction, that mandate, that command? <sighs> yeah, that, that classic partial obedience, you know, that kind of thing. <clears throat> so, yeah, he took his dad and he took his nephew with him. But the Lord told him, he says, hey, he, he said, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. What else did he tell him? He told him he's going to bless him. Yeah, all nations be blessed. All the families be blessed. He said, you're going to be blessed. All the nations of the world are going to be blessed. And that you'll be a blessing, right? He told him he's going to make his name great. Is there anything wrong with your name being great if God tells you your name's going to be great? No, nothing wrong at all. There is something seriously wrong with trying to attain a great name in and of yourself. And he says, I'm going to bless those who are going to bless you. I'm going to curse those who will curse you. Uh, wait, not yet, Jan. Not in, in Genesis 12, he didn't say anything about Sarah having a baby. Uh, hang on to that. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, and he's, but he tells them all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram, he did what the Lord told him to do. Well, sort of. It, who's that like? <laughs> it's like everybody on the screen right here, right? Yeah, but we're getting better. We're getting better. We seek to do what the Lord wants us to do without taking anything away from it or adding anything to it. How old was Abraham or Abram? I'm trying to use the proper name here. He didn't become Abraham to the 17th chapter. He was 75 at this time. And he came. <clears throat> oh, no problem. I'm just going to work through Genesis right here because that's the most logical way of doing it, right? He was 75 years old when he left and he comes and he finally makes it to the land of Canaan. And so he makes the trip relatively quickly. Uh -huh. Okay. So yeah, things happen under the Oaks. Isn't that great? Uh, what happened under the Oaks? And these are the Oaks of uh, Mamre. Is that right? Is that how you say that? Mamre or something like that? Yeah, there was a land promise. Yeah. Okay, Moray, okay. <laughs> Chapter 12. And he, God appears to him again. And that's a big thing I want us to see. Uh, he, particularly from our perspective and from our lives where we live and the time we live in. You know, we read these accounts where God appears and God speaks. And we think that was for another place, another time, another world. Okay. 
Yeah, the promises are repeated, not only from generation to generation to generation, but to Abraham, to Abram, to the individuals. But does God do the same thing today? Does the Lord uh, speak to us? Does the Lord appear? Out of most of our backgrounds, most people say, well, no, no, God doesn't do that anymore uh, because we have the Bible. We have the word of God. So there's no need of him doing that. Boy, you got to be real careful when you say that kind of thing. We rejoice because we have the word of God. Okay, we rejoice in that. But you've got to be real careful to come back and say, okay, yeah, God doesn't do this anymore. Rachel says it's connected to geography too. Do we need to be in the right place in the right time? Are you asking that as a question? Maybe you're asking that as a question. <laughs> no, I have no doubt about that. Okay. I have no doubt about that. That's something I deal with just about on a daily basis, just between us girls. Okay. <clears throat> because I wonder, you know, Lord, what is going on with where I am and where we are and what's happening, et cetera, et cetera. And I've been wondering that for 20 years now. But one thing I haven't wondered is that I still think, that we are where we're supposed to be geographically speaking. And I'm speaking about the area, the region, uh, mm. this little hamlet of a town right here where we are, uh, basically this county. Okay, I think there is a thing like that. And a lot of, uh, uh, of my friends and a lot of folks, we talk a lot about that, uh, that there is a thing about being in the right geographical will of God. So Rachel says, the color of my notes, pink, promise, orange, age, green, geography. Interesting to see the pattern. And there is. There is a, uh, an awareness of a pattern. And particularly if you add timing into that, you know, the mentions of the timing here and the flow of that, uh, you see that what the Lord says over in Ephesians is absolutely correct. He's got a plan before the foundations of the world, of the work that he has for us, right? So Lynn says, I've always heard I must be in a place of obedience. How can I hear God if I'm not being obedient to what he's already told me? <laughs> yeah, isn't that truth? <laughs> now, had Abram been obedient to what God had already told him? Uh, generally speaking, yes. He had left, <laughs> okay? He may not have done the details exactly right, okay? And I find that encouraging, but he left. So tell me, what did you say? And you know, I, we don't have time to get into the 13th, the 14th chapter. You didn't do that in your homework. Most of y'all probably did what I did in the homework. When you're sitting there and you give me part of a chapter, then say, okay, jump ahead and skip the next 15 verses, go to the next part of the next chapter. I'm going, are you kidding me? I got to read this whole thing. Okay. <laughs> you used to get the flow of things. So Rachel says, if Noah didn't uh, do the details, the boat would have sunk. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm not sure how much of the details he got at first. You know, we know the Lord told him how to do things like that. And the Lord will tell us how to do that. But, you know, the walk of faith isn't being able to see from where we are now to the very end. The walk of faith is not even taking the first step. The walk of faith is picking up your foot, not knowing where it's going to land. That's a walk of faith. And that's sort of where we are. So tell me what happened in verses, uh, verses chapters 15, uh, 16 and 17. Uh, what happens in chapter 15? Uh, 15 is the one that's quoted all the way through Romans, right? It's, it's quoted three times in that fourth chapter. What happens in uh, uh, Genesis 15? Okay, yeah, so the Lord, he speaks to Abram again, okay? He speaks to him again. And, you know, I still don't understand all, how all these various things happen. As a matter of fact, I'm probably going to send uh, uh, y'all a couple of links on the Facebook page just for your edification and reading if you want to. There's some really, really cool things here uh, that I'm still wondering about and I still don't know. Uh -huh. So the Lord speaks another promise to Abram. This time it's about a reward. Okay. And, uh, and you know, God's saying, hey, yeah, yeah, you, you want to have these descendants. Well, Abraham, how did he respond? He brought up what? <clears throat> yeah, you're going to, he says, well, I guess my, my descendants are going to be what? Isn't that where he mentioned his servant? That kind of thing. 
But this time, God says what? Let me, tell you, let me just pull it up right here. <clears throat> yeah, he had a child with Hagar. Uh, let me see. Can y'all see that? Verse 15. We well, should be able to see it. It's bright and white. Genesis 15, 5. Uh, I'll tell you, let's just start in verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram. I'm a shield to you. <laughs> Your reward shall be very great. Abraham says, O Lord, what will you give me since I am childless, and the heir of my child is Eleazar of Damascus? He hadn't had Hagar yet. I mean, well, yeah, <laughs> Ishmael or Hagar, I guess you could say it that way, crudely. Uh, that hadn't happened yet. So he's sitting there going, okay, I guess the heir is going to be, you know, from Eleazar. Abram said, since you've given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Do y'all detect anything there in verse three, maybe? Or am I just reading something into something? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm thinking, Cameron. A little, maybe a little snarky, maybe a little throwing it back. And yeah, I think it's frustration of throwing it back. Hey, God, you've promised me, but since you haven't given any offspring to me, I guess my my servant's going to have to be it. Yeah. And, you know, it is. Rachel says it's so common to try to work out the promises, you know. And uh, see how the promise is going to happen with what we see and with what not with what we don't see. Isn't that truth? Uh, you know, we can graciously perhaps just say that Abram was just reminding God that he hadn't followed through on his promise yet. But, he, you know, Abram, I, I love this. Was, was he being honest? Was he being forthright? Is this how he was feeling? Absolutely. So verse 4, Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, this man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. So what did Abram learn right here? He learned that this child is going to come from his body. <laughs> now, the thing is, later on, he has this promise. He tells his wife this promise, but they still didn't have anything. That's when his wife comes to him and says, well, you know, take Hagar and have that. She's instantly pregnant. So you're sitting there thinking, well, that's from his body. But then after a period of time, Abram goes for God and God says, no, no, no. It's going to be between you and Sarah. And, you know, I can't help but think, you know, Abram's going, well, what? you know, could you have made that a little clearer earlier? <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, but that's the walk of faith is so often the walk of faith. It, we mess it up by our presumption. Yeah, there's layers of layers of promises, and we have layers of layers of things in our minds of how we can make the promises come true. You know what I mean? Rather than resting in it. Then he says this in verse 5. And he took him outside and said, Now, look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you're able to count them. And he said to them, So shall your descendants be. So what was God saying right there? Okay, it, so many descendants that you can't count them? Yeah. And that's often the uh, uh, the interpretation, okay? <clears throat> Uh, when you have time sometime, this is the link I'll put on the Facebook page. Check this out right here, okay? Because there's also a school of thought that uh, that the promise isn't just quantitatively. Quantitative is the term that's used. In other words, numbers, which is totally fine. But it may also reflect qualitative, Okay. And this comes from a doctor from a presentation paper. Let me just throw this up here and read it to you. It's the conclusion of it. And this is you'll run across this in academia, and I think there's truth here. Uh, and this, this goes to the divine counsel mindset and of, of uh, Deuteronomy 32 and of Psalm 82 and some things that we continue to talk about. And it says this: In conclusion, it's necessary to restate the initial problem this paper sought to answer. Esler noticed a deficiency in the quantitative only interpretation of Paul's use of Genesis 15.5. This is coming out of Romans 4. Seeming far too unlikely that having numerous descendants would somehow be equivalent of inheriting of the cosmos. 
because in Romans 4, particularly out of the Septuagint, it gives a little different twist. Becoming the father of nations, the expectation of being the resurrected from the dead. So this paper poses a possible answer to this problem. Reading Paul's use of Genesis 15 in light of early Jewish deification traditions stemming from a qualitative as well as a quantitative interpretation of Abrahamic promise provides fruitful results. The proposal is supported by widely attested interpretive traditions from Paul's early Jewish historical context with the Palestinian Hellenistic uh, and is further received into the uh, Petrinus. Uh, Patrick's tradition is seen as origin. Mm. So the bottom line with this is there it may be a lot more to this <laughs> than we think, okay, which is often the way and with the word of God. Yeah, it is a a quantity, a number of descendants, but even the type of descendants and what God was promising Abraham here in the midst of this. It's really, uh, really interesting. Some things to consider, not only now, but down the road as we go along. Okay. So anyway, so what was Abraham's response to all this? Well, the great verse six, then he believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. So what are we saying here? Lynn says, uh, the land will be your uh, descendants implying nations. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He says nations. Um, well, even here, uh, he says nations uh, later on. He talks about them being um, slaves to a nation and some things. But Abram believed God. He believed the word of the Lord. Now, had he believed the Lord before? Okay, when he left in Genesis 12, I ran across an interesting little phrase in a commentary or resource or something this week that really got me thinking. He, he did when he left, and under the oaks, he built an altar to the Lord. But this phrase was used, and it's got me thinking about some stuff. Can you say that up to this point in time that he was following the Lord, but it's at this point in time that he believed that he followed the Lord for a period of years, but it's here that he actually believed because God makes a big deal about this right here. Yeah. In Genesis 12, he talked about following him here. He believed this is the verse that's quoted three times in Romans four and quoted two or three other times in the new Testament. And it, yes. And this is ever before all of our minds of how many people follow the Lord yet. They do not really believe. We know the Lord himself told us about that. You know, many going to say in the last days, Lord, Lord, did we not, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Lynn says she gets uh, 12 is, faith you follow because you're supposed to well yeah he followed because the lord did what he told him to do this and he did it <laughs> and so that is a a degree of faith that is a degree of belief i have no problem with that because he did believe god but this thing right here where he told him this is how your descendant is going to be not only the number and the quantity of them but the quality of them to the point of what you see over in romans 4 how Paul is using that, that this right here, and I don't want to get into an argument of the particular moment uh, that Abraham was saved, but then he believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteous. Is it at this point in time that God reckoned him to be righteous? He'd been following him. He'd been obedient. He was doing what God wanted him to do. I don't know. There's some interesting things here. So the balance says chapter right here, the Lord, this is when he made covenant with God, okay, and promised him the land and everything. Uh, Rachel, what happened afterwards seemed to really affect Abram, the panic attack in the night after cutting the animals up, et cetera. Uh, yeah, this whole thing, <coughs> I still, and, you know, I have looked at this and looked at this and looked at this, and I still don't know and feel comfortable with explaining what happens. In verse 1, the Lord comes to Abram in a vision. Okay, he's in a vision. What does that mean? That means the Lord's speaking to him at this time, right? In, in, in a vision somehow. 
but then it transitions once, twice, or I don't know. Look at verse 7. You have the whole encounter, and he says, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur, the Chaldees, to give you this land to possess it. He said, oh, Lord, how may I know that I will possess it? So uh, Abram asked a legitimate question, uh, very much like what Mary is going to ask. You know, how do I know this is going to happen? I'm a virgin. How do I know I'm going to possess it? So then he tells Abram to do what? <coughs> to go and fetch these animals. Is this in a dream or did Abram actually, or in a vision, or did Abram actually do this? So he takes the animals. So I'm waiting for an answer from y'all. And he cuts them all in half, except for the, uh, the birds. You assumed he did what? That he actually did the thing? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> and because he finds the animals. He cuts them in half. The birds of prey come down on the carcass, and Abram's driving them away. What is that about? You know, we don't really have time to get into the details. When you study Genesis, it's sort of interesting. Is this a picture of something else for that birds of prey? And then it says the sun goes down, and a deep sleep falls upon Abram. Well, what happened to the vision? Is it that he had the vision up here and that the Lord says, hey, go get these animals, and he goes out of the vision, and he does what he's doing in the natural with the animals, and when the sun goes down, that he then puts Abram into a deep sleep. Am I losing y'all here with my confusion? <laughs> you know? So I'm thinking maybe he was spoken to by vision. Then he goes and gets the animals in real life, shall we say, for lack of a better term. The sun goes down, and then God places a deep sleep upon Abram. And then that's when terror and great darkness fell upon him. You know, I, I don't know if I want to, who was that, Rachel, was it you that called that a panic attack? I don't know if I want to call it a panic attack because the associations that we have with that today. It's just the idea of just terror and great darkness. Something happens. <clears throat> yeah, the vision, uh, could it be exhaustion? Because if this was physical work, there's no doubt. And this is when God tells him, he says, hey, you know this for certain. Your descendants are going to be strangers in the land. It's not theirs. They're going to be enslaved. They're going to be oppressed for 400 years. But I want to judge that nation whom they're going to serve. And afterward, they'll come out with many possessions. And you see that happening exactly like that. As for you, you will go to your fathers in peace. You will be buried at a good old age. And then this is the reason that the children of Israel, even when they were in Egypt, knew that something was about to happen because of what they knew from the word of the Lord right here. Then in the fourth generation, they will return here for the iniquity of Amorite is not yet complete. Looking back, we can discern that, that a generation's length of time then was 100 years because they were there 400 years, right? Yeah, uh, Rachel says related to the experience, that same thing in Houston that night. It felt like that, that darkness and terror. <clears throat> but it says that on that day, the Lord made covenant with Abram. Uh, this is still one of the most intriguing chapters as to what happened and what occurred and what the Lord was saying. Okay. So we got to press on what happens in the 16th chapter. <laughs> yeah. Abraham, Abram still doesn't have the children. So Sarah comes up with a plan and she says, here, uh, take my, uh, Egyptian handmaid, Hagar, and raise up a child unto us. And so what was Abram's response to that? I usually have fun with this in the local classes. <laughs> cool, let's do it. That's right. Well, yeah, I actually use the uh, Hebrew, uh, yeah, baby, baby. You know, I can do that. And, and can you imagine the family stress? We don't have to imagine some of it later on, but can you just, you know, when you, when you read these passages, it says, and then she looked with disdain upon her. Boy, you can really understand that. Um, so uh, he has, uh, he's 86 years old when Ishmael was born, which means he's probably conceived when he's 85 years old. Okay. And so they have a child and they assume this child is what? Yeah, the heir. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, you know, I do. I actually, <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything tonight about this, but I'm just, 
I, I think that we don't really read the word um, with the fullness of understanding that these are human people just like us in every way, folks, you know, and that, you know, uh, just thinking about that, even um, that something happened when Abram was 99 years old, you know, that something happened. And so anyway, uh, you have this child that Abram loved and loved beyond measure. But then God appears to Abram again, Genesis chapter 17. How old is Abram at this time? As I said, he's 99 years old. Uh, the culture is different. Wasn't it common to take other wives? It was common to take other wives. It was common to have other concubines. Abram, after Sarah dies, actually, uh, marries his concubine Keturah and has six other sons as well as other daughters, which is the reason in the Middle East when they say, hey, we're of Abraham, that's absolutely true, but they're not of the line of the promise. So he's 99 years old <coughs> and the Lord appears to him again. Notice this pattern. The Lord's appearing. The Lord's appearing. And what does the Lord tell him this time? He establishes the covenant with him. He's already promised the covenant. He's already made covenant with him. He's reminding him of this covenant. How long has it been? Okay. It's been at this time, 13 years since they've had Ishmael. Ishmael's a young man now, very loved by Abram. But God tells him, hey, you're going to be a father of a multitude of nations. He changed his name. Why did he change his name? How did he change his name? Is that significant? It means a father of many nations now. How did his name and Ceres name change? I mean, even in the English form, how was it changed here? Added what? Yeah. Okay, God's name is this, Yahweh. A shortened form of that you see in scripture is this, Yah. The Lord literally added this into both their names. He literally added his name into their name, and it changed the name, the meaning of their names to the father of nations and the mother of nations type of thing. He literally inserted his name into that. So now he's Abraham, and he gave him the sign of the covenant. What's the sign of the Abrahamic covenant? Yeah, circumcision. And he reiterated the promise again. I'm going to give you the land. I'm going to give you the offspring. And he told Abram that he and all his men were to be circumcised. So what did Abraham do? Now, Abraham, he followed through. So he was circumcised. Ishmael was circumcised. Ishmael's 13 years old. All the men that were a part of them would have been circumcised. <clears throat> Would this have been a fun party? Uh, no, but they were faithful. Yeah. <laughs> Though they healed rather rapidly from other biblical accounts uh, of this kind of thing happening. And the Lord promised that they would have a son by Sarah at the same time next year. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. That's the story. Yeah. <clears throat> that the Lord promised that this would happen. Do you notice anything interesting about this? In relationship to circumcision, in relationship to the conception of the sons. It's not a big thing, but it's just something sort of interesting. I think there may be more to it. Than that. After obedience comes to promise. As long as he had the flesh, he had a child of the flesh. When the flesh was removed through obedience, the promise came. There's just something that's moved from the back of my mind to the middle of my mind related to that. And I don't know what it is, but I think there's something significant there. And when the flesh was removed, that's when the promise came. Uh, we can claim that promise in our lives. We're, you know, we're called uh, to die in the flesh daily, which I respect people that can die daily. I have to do it breath by breath. You know, it's too easy for the f flesh to be resurrected. So what happens in Genesis 18? You read those passages are in the middle of it, 10, 15, right there. 
where the promise came that Sarah, you know, was going to have a child. And yeah, she laughed. She didn't believe it. She was, I, I think she was joyously rejoicing, uh, laughing it off, uh, <coughs> doubting it. Why? Abram was 100 years old. She was 90. It's not many 90 year olds having babies. And, uh, you know, this is before there was any help in any way. Yeah, you have this whole thing that next year, guess what? When I come back this season, next year, you're going to have a son. So what happens? Exactly what God said, you see in Genesis 21. How long did Abraham wait for this son that was promised initially? Yeah, 25 years. Yeah, quarter of a century. Abraham believed. Sarah believed. Abraham circumcised Isaac on the eighth day. You see that in Genesis 21. Everything is great and wonderful. What happens in Genesis 22? Why in the world does he take Isaac sacrificing? Yeah, isn't that interesting, Rachel? Solomon and Gomorrah having in that one year promised baby born. There's all sorts of things we can glean. And for <clears throat> God told him to. God said, I want you to get up. I want you to go to this land. And then I'm going to show you a mountain there. And I want you to take the boy there. And I want you to sacrifice him. Abraham gets up, he takes the boy. How old was Isaac at this time? What can you tell me assuredly? Uh, assuredly, we don't know. Old enough to carry the wood on an extended trip right here. <clears throat> yeah, old enough. he's old enough he could have fought back. How old is it that you can fight back? Trust me, I got grandkids this age, eight or nine years, <laughs> they can take off. <clears throat> you know, we don't know. He was probably old enough to be nearly of age, maybe 13. We simply don't know. <clears throat> so he comes, and you know the account that happened in Genesis 22 right there, that, that great line uh, where Isaac says, uh, hey, father, you know, we got the wood. We got the fire. Where's the sacrifice? And boy, talk about the wisdom of the Lord, because I mean, I'm sitting there so many times, I'm thinking, what would I have stuttered as a response to that? The Lord will provide for himself a sacrifice. I love that. The Lord will provide for himself. In other words, what? It's not my decision. It's really not my call, not my problem. I don't mean that flippantly, okay? But this is not mine. This is the Lord's. The Lord will provide for himself a sacrifice. And then you know what happened, that the Lord stops them at the last moment. And we saw this in Hebrews. It's a great, great picture. Remember what we saw in Hebrews 11? <clears throat> of what, uh, what we actually gleaned from this, of what Abraham's thinking was. You don't see this from the Old Testament accounts. Uh, Rachel says, I wouldn't have gone through it. Even starting out traveling for three days, I would still be at home. <coughs> you think so? How did God describe what Abraham did here in Genesis 22? What, Ab what God called Abraham to do, the Lord described it as a what? Remember the scripture, the one word? Wasn't it called a test? And I think these kind of things happen to us a lot and the Lord uh, will test us. And what may be an easy thing for somebody will be a, a test for somebody else. You know, we're all different. He calls us the different things. <clears throat> but what we learned from Hebrews is that Abraham was, Abraham was just thinking, you know what? This is the child of the promise. Not, not other kids. This one right here. Not another one after him. This one. And if God wants me to sacrifice this one, then it's God's call. It's God's situation. It's God's problem. 
And if he wants me to kill him, then God's going to have to do what? <laughs> Raise him from the dead. <clears throat> do you know what, do you remember what God's response was after he stopped Abraham from doing this? Remember what God said? Didn't he say something along the line? Now I know that you love me. Yeah. Well, the thing is, God would have known that. <laughs> he totally knew. But it was a test, not only for God's sake, but I think more so for Abraham's sake, since you did not withhold from me your only son. I think what all of us want is to commune with God and walk with God and communicate with God to the degree that we would walk with that level of faith, knowing that we truly heard and that this is what the Lord wants. I guess without the doubt, you know what I'm saying? Because Rachel, I'm like you. I would have totally said, okay, yes, yes, yes. This is what I'm supposed to do. And about five minutes later, my, me in the flesh would have been second guessing. I've heard wrong, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that kind of thing. So now going to Romans 4 real quick, just walking through what we saw in previous weeks. Mm. What do we learn? Uh, Rachel says, yes, that is so painful. <laughs> I live. Do we not all live with it? <clears throat> I could throw a million things out like that. Biggies. <laughs> when things happen in your kid's life, your adult kid's life, do you ever doubt how you raised them and what you said to them and the things that you did 5, 10, 20, 25, 30, 40 years ago? <laughs> like I know I wasn't going to get a loud yes from that. I got two girls that are about to turn 43 and 41. Tell me I don't have second guessing going on. But you know how I combat that? I guess I say, Lord, Lord, it's nothing I can do about the past, right? What I can do now is just press on the truth and in love and just do whatever. And then uh, just manifest him before them constantly. Find myself walking in a lot of humility before them. You know, they'll say some things and it's not malicious thing. It's not hateful. A lot of times they're laughing about stuff, you know, this or that and the other. They'll say something. I say, yeah, 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 you're right. I did that. I probably should have done that that way. I wouldn't do it that way now. And they go, yeah, I know, because you're like that with the grandkids. Well, that's the advantage of grandkids. You've, you've got one generation under your belt. Oh, give me a second chance here, Lord, you know. Yeah, Jan, isn't it the truth? <laughs> Jan knew these little girls when they were little girls. But it's a great thing. I mean, it's a great thing. But no, you don't walk in that doubt. You know, you don't do that. So what do we see about Abraham, Abraham in the fourth chapter of Romans? Uh, what's the point? Why is he, you know, the, the whole thing here? Uh, he started talking about him at the very beginning, verses 4 through 12. We find out that the righteous man is blessed, okay? In the same way that Abraham was counted as righteous because he believed it's the same way today, not based upon works. You'll have good works out of that. But that's, you're, you don't receive righteousness and you don't have it credited you by your good works. Abraham was the example. He was the example for the Jews, for the circumcised, for the Gentiles, those who will believe. He's the father of all who will believe, including the multitude of, general, of nations. It is by faith, accordance with grace. Yeah. I, you know, what, what did the Lord say about this in Galatians 3, by the way? I don't want to forget that passage. He said to be a nation be blessed by him. What else did he say? He has ape seeds, not seeds. Yeah, that was interesting, right? It's Jesus. The seed is Christ. Is that the verse? The passage that said that the Lord preached the gospel to Abraham. <clears throat> I think that's where it was, wasn't it? <clears throat> the Lord preached the gospel to Abraham. The gospel, the good news, what's the good news? <clears throat> the good news of, yes, the multitude. The good news, yes, of the seed. The good news of it being by faith and by belief to all the nations. <clears throat> Yes, yeah, a, a really interesting thing. So then uh, back to Romans uh, 4. Uh, 
the promise was given to Abraham before the law was there, ever existed, folks. He was credited as righteous before the law. He was a righteous man before the law. And that's what Paul's driving home here. Okay. That, you know what? The law is going to bring wrath because you can't keep the wrath. I mean, you can't keep the law, right? He said that to him. You have to be like Abraham did. He believed through faith. You can't rest upon the law. Okay. Jesus didn't invalidate the law. He fulfilled it. Okay. And we know what you saw in Galatians again, that the law was given as a tutor uh, to lead us to Christ. Okay. It's that truth and that principle, but you have to believe. So Paul kept going all the way through the fourth chapter. All who believe are from Abraham. He's building the argument. Remember that? And that God is the one who gives a life, life to the dead, uh, spiritual life to those that are spiritually dead, literally physical life to Abraham or Abram and Sarai, literally physical life to them to produce physical life. And in verse 18, you see it reiterated again. Uh, the Lord reckoned it unto Abraham because he believed. And I loved, uh, let's, let's go there. I want to see this real quick because I remember, I don't remember if we said anything about this last week, so much in this fourth chapter, uh, to do Romans four. I don't know where, where is this? Let's jump down to verse 18. <clears throat> Maybe, uh, <clears throat> Oh, I love this verse 19 without becoming weak in faith. He contemplated his own body. Now as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. So he contemplated this stuff. I love that. He was thinking about this, but he didn't become weak in faith, but not only this, watch what happens. There, there was a progression here, folks. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith. So that's what you've seen over all of this thing, even though they made that decision about Ishmael. And I don't want to come back and call it a mistake. They made that decision. God knew about that before the foundations of the earth. And there's going to be untold millions that would be in the kingdom of God forever and ever out of that line. Okay. But he began, he realized that the God told him that that's not the child of the promise. He didn't waver in unbelief, but he grew strong in faith giving glory to God. What do you do when you're contemplating your body? What do you do when you're contemplating your situation and it's good as dead? Hey, give glory to God. Don't waver in unbelief. Stand strong in belief. Verse 21, and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able to, to perform. So this, this whole thing right here, no, he didn't become weak in faith, even though he's contemplating this thing. He kept believing. He kept believing. He didn't waver. He grew strong in faith. He gave glory to God. Out of that comes full assurance that God can do what he wants to, that God can bring forth an Isaac from their dead bodies, that God can resurrect Isaac if he's required to be sacrificed. So therefore, verse 22, for the third time, it was also credited to him as righteousness <clears throat> not now not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him but for our sake also to whom it will be credited as those who believe in him who raised jesus our lord from the dead he was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification let me see what rachel says but you have to be clear on what he has promised. Sometimes the promise in relationship, in relation to your personal situation, is hard to be clear on. Oh yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. So what are we clear on what he's promised? And I think that's the big stuff. Are we clear um, that with God, nothing's impossible? Do we clearly understand that? Do we clearly understand that it is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ that we are reconciled before the most high God? You know, I think we have to believe these big things to be empowered. 
uh, to understand in the midst of the hard times. One last verse here real quick. You looked up something in the book of James, the second chapter. <laughs> oh, about a dozen verses, 10 or 12 verses. I don't remember how. What did that say in relationship to all this? Yeah, that's the bottom line with it. A lot of times people will say, hey, this is a, <coughs> it conflicts with the previous thing. No, the bottom line is that faith, uh, when it is applied, has works. And James uses Abraham. And he uses uh, uh, the example of uh, Abraham offering Isaac up. And he wasn't justified by the works, but his faith, it adds to the understanding. Yeah, the devil believes there's no God. They got enough sense to uh, shudder, you know. The bottom line is this. If you have, if you truly believe, if you have true faith, if you're truly saved, then that's going to bring forth works, okay? If you say that you believe, if you say that you have faith, but you do not have works, if the works reveal that you don't have true faith, true believers are going to have works. And uh, the passage I mentioned before in Ephesians talks about that, how the Lord's prepared uh, the works for us. All believers are going to have deeds and, and, and works that the Lord's called us to. By works, a man is justified and not by faith only. If your faith is the faith only and it has no works, it's a false faith. So Abraham believed God. It was reckoned unto him as righteous. You saw sort of a pattern, of a process in his entire life of what occurred. Uh, that's the reason that God uses him. Uh, not just because he's the a forefather of the Jewish people, but because I see a lot of us in that life right there. You know, a lot of us. So anything else y'all want to share real quick? Because our time is up. <clears throat> Excuse me. We'll keep pressing on. We've got two more lessons. I know we're, we're, we're going up real close to Christmas. That's the only way to get this whole course in. So uh, anyway, I appreciate that. So the next two lessons, we're dealing with Romans 5 and uh, Adam and Christ. Okay? So, Father, I thank you for the life of Abraham and Sarah and how, Lord, uh, even after these multitudes of thousands of years, they speak into us uh, such truths. Uh, Lord, can we say that we can't wait till we get to meet them face to face? I think we can. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless y'all, and thank you so much. Keep pressing on. And uh, I'll throw those links up for you later, okay? And, Rachel, you probably shouldn't have said that, like in links, because I've got links. <laughs> uh, the next class will start, um, uh, I think we'll actually do lesson one, January the 14th. Is that right? I believe that's right. I'll confirm all that later with us, okay? But I think that's right. Okay, see y'all then.